We're going to bring in our next guest right now, Mike Volpe. He is general partner at Index Futures. He was formerly the chief strategy officer at Cisco. And, uh, Mike, you've been watching what's been happening for quite a while in Silicon Valley and the private markets. Mm -hmm. Does this come as a shock to you uh, to, to watch some of these IPOs perform as poorly as they have since they came public? Well, not entirely. I think that um, some of these stocks, some of these companies traded pretty quickly to pretty stratospheric levels just after the IPO. And a little bit of that has to do with the fact that these are new businesses and the market has a bit of a hard time understanding what they really look like after they mature and after they've been road tested on IPOs for a couple of quarters. So the market has brought them back. If you actually look at the multiples of these companies, they're still quite rich or at least reasonable. And so I'd say no surprise that they've come back down. Valuations based on what? Many of them don't have earnings. Multiples on revenue, fundamentally, okay. uh, around comparables. Mm -hmm. So you, you are seeing still reasonably rich multiples or, or fair multiples, if you want to call them. And it's not a surprise that some of them have come back down to earth a little bit. Um, it, it seems to me that... Look, it's not a surprise to see these valuations take off in the private markets, considering how much cash has been floating around. What, what has been abrupt is the public market's refusal to kind of go along with that party. It, 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 you know, it's been like a screeching halt watching this and saying, we're not going to fund those things. Does that come as a big surprise to people in the Valley? I would say to some, maybe. I, uh, but it, I think it's super understandable. Public markets at the end of the day are very rational. Uh, they, they look at the fundamentals of the business, income statements, balance sheets, P&Ls, and will evaluate what the company is worth. At least over a period of time, they'll evaluate what the company's worth. Our job as private investors often is to invest on a vision, a strategy, a dream. It's sort of like uh, investing in a college athlete when you don't know how they're going to perform in the pros. And so sometimes you get it right and you get it cheap and it's going to do great. And sometimes you get a little bit wrong because they don't perform to the potential that you thought they had. Although I still hear you talking about valuations and, and using those valuations in terms of revenue and not earnings. And that may be a reckoning where the public markets just aren't going to support it to that extent that, you know, forget about it. I, I don't think these companies haven't performed the way they were supposed to. In their prospectuses, they all said, we might never see a road to profit. We may never make a profit. That's a pretty bold statement. And, you know, to this point, in hindsight, it looks like they've been coddled to say, yes, growth at all costs. You don't have to worry about profitability. Yeah, I have no argument there. I think that's right. I, I do think that there are uh, some of those companies that have shown high degrees of cash consumption discipline when they were private and as they've become public they've performed well mm -hmm. so you look at like a data dog or you look at an elastic both of our companies uh, they've done well in the public markets companies that don't have a prospect of producing earnings are going to at some point struggle and that's what you're seeing at uber and that's what you're seeing potentially at lyft uh, and that's what uh, at the end of the day that's what we work showed do you think that psychologically as these lockup expirations start kind of unfolding throughout the remainder of the year for all those ipos that took place in the first half of the year psychologically for these companies that are really underwater from their ipo price does it make people more inclined to sell or less inclined to sell into the lockup expiration uh, it's a super tricky thing to say. I, I think it very much depends on the circumstances of the shareholder. In some cases, if they invested super early, let's imagine that they were Series A or Series B private investors in the company, the gain they've made is so substantial, whether the stock is up or down, that there may be an incentive to take some money off the table. But if you have later stage investors that showed up when the company was worth 40, 50 billion, they might have that psychological effect unless they have desperate need to look for liquidity to stay. I'm going to hang in there a little bit longer to see if this thing shapes. Bradley Tusk was with us earlier. He was a very early investor in Uber because he was a political consultant for Travis Kalanick when he was there. Um, he made the point that for 10 years, a lot of these employees have been rich on paper, but they haven't really had access to ways to kind of get some of the money out. A couple of years ago, SoftBank yeah. bought some of it. But it, he made the point that some of them may very likely sell today just because you got to make good on some of that. And by the way, a lot of them were granted those things, so it's not like they're underwater. They're just not as rich as they thought that you were. Yeah, I think the employee base will probably sell some. I would doubt that that was going to have a deep, deep impact on the stock price. I think it's the institutional investors that are going to have more of an impact. Mm -hmm. And then private investors, individuals that work at the company, won't sell the minute the lockup comes off. There'll be a little more of a tail there. The risk will be the early stage institutional investors who have been in there for a while and have a 10, 20, 30 times gain on the original investment they made. 
and they're going to say, look, I'm just going to take my money off the table. I've made way, way more than I expected anyway. So are these stocks safer to invest in, let's say, three months from now when some of that's kind of cleared and kind of out of the way? Somewhat. I would say, look, uh, a stock like Uber is pretty widely traded. So there's going to be some real short-term volatility when the lockup expires, but I wouldn't expect it to last more than a week. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, see what happens over the next few days. But thereafter, I think it'll steady out. And I think the really the big issue for a company like Uber is how are they going to get their earnings? You know, they're still spending nearly a billion dollars a year on self-driving initiatives. If they can cut some of those and look more like a profitable company, that's what's really going to move the Did stock you cut your price. teeth at Cisco for just learning everything you need with acquisitions there? How many acquisitions did, did you make at, at Cisco? Uh, when I was there, it was about 75, 80. 75 or 80. Yeah. That seems like it's almost cheating. And then you went out and did it yourself, and you got these great companies in your portfolio now. Can you call us next? Do you see anything going on now? That, Leslie, right? Mm -hmm. can, can you whisper to us something really good that's happening out there? Joe, we run an investment fund. You're welcome to invest. We'll take I don't your know money. If I'm, allowed. Not. <laughs> I'm not? No. Sorry. Anyway, uh, Thank yeah, you, Bill. yeah, pleasure. Thank nice you. Being here. He's on this this fancy list. Did you see this? Uh, that Mike's in. There's the, the top guys out there for for venture capital. But it helps to be work at Cisco. How many years? I was there for 13 years. 13 years. Yeah. Fantastic. That ride. didn't hurt, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you.